Hello, everyone, and welcome to Post Podium, a podcast where former Jeopardy contestants are instead given questions and asked to provide answers. I am your host, Jarek Bruel, and joining me today is former Jeopardy champion Finn Corrigan. A student from Vista, California, Finn first appeared on the show on March 17th, 2022, winning two games and a total of $40,602. What viewers of the show might not know is that being on the syndicated show wasn't Finn's first Jeopardy taping experience. He was actually an alternate for the Jeopardy! National College Championship, which aired during the month of February 2022. I'll be asking Finn questions about watching the JNCC from afar and taping for the syndicated show. And hopefully by the end of this episode, we'll find out to what extent Finn's time as an alternate helped prepare him for the real deal. The following conversation will include spoilers from both the JNCC and Finn's episodes, so as always, if you haven't watched either of them, I suggest you watch those episodes first and listen to this podcast later. We hope you enjoy this episode of Post Podium. All right, let's get to it. How about we start by stating your name, when you first appeared on Jeopardy, and how you did and finished. All right, yeah, so I'm Finn Corrigan. My first episode aired on March 17th, 2022, St. Patrick's Day. And then I was on the following day, uh, March 18th. And then after that, I was on the Monday, which I guess would have been the 21st, if my yep. math is right. And that was the one I finally lost. <laughs> uh, but I did win, I think, slightly over $40,000. Nothing to be ashamed of, I suppose. Winning just one game of Jeopardy is incredible. In and oh, itself. even just make, even, even making it on the show. That too, that too. I think. So, so yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's, I think that's important for all fans to recognize that getting on the show is really hard. You know, 400 to 500 oh, yeah. people are selected per season so yeah i think that's yeah. also important to keep in mind i'm glad we're finally getting to do this since once this episode's released it'll be about a month since your episode aired or your first episode aired rather did it ever occur to anyone during your taping day that a guy with an irish name would be making his jeopardy debut on st patrick's <laughs> day yeah i saw some questions uh to that effect on reddit and you know i don't even know if the producers were doing that and in- on purpose they might have because they like to be cute like that sometimes but um yeah i don't know it definitely wasn't something we talked about until it happened and then it was kind of funny there was a little like on that note there was a little thing right before we went on stage for that first game where they were trying to put like one of us in green as they wanted to like do a same thing <laughs> there's actually i think there's like a kind of behind the scenes argument between different producers and stuff because like some some people were like no like it doesn't matter let's just like start like taping and then people were like no we have to find like a you know a specific clothing item or whatever and it ended up not happening and the ironic thing is i ended up wearing a um, green coat on the friday episode which doesn't show up as green on tv though i was really sad because i spent a lot of money on that coat and i really liked it it showed up as like kind of just dull and like black but but yeah it was funny uh but no yeah we never really thought it would be like an irish thing until it happened i guess that's hilarious and now that you brought it up i i can't imagine that was just pure coincidence that had to be yeah. somewhat intentional based on that story i'm sure told. yeah but um that's very interesting I, I actually didn't know that so finn you didn't get to hear this but before we started our recording session today i taped a small intro for you and mentioned how on the show your title was a student from vista california can you tell us more? Where do you go to school? What year of your undergrad are you in? And what are you majoring in? Yeah, so I go to UCLA and I'm a sophomore currently. I'm majoring in history with a minor in geography. That's about it. I just love Los Angeles. I love SoCal, so I'm glad I stuck, stuck around here because I am from San Diego Vista's mm. a, a northern suburb of San Diego. So yeah. I also mentioned at the top of the episode that taping for the syndicated show wasn't your first time inside the Jeopardy studio. You were actually one of three alternate undergrads for the Jeopardy National College Championship. In previous episodes of Post Podium, contestants from the tournament have spoken about their on-campus watch party experiences and talked extensively about how a lot of their friends from college, along with some of their student bodies, came out to support them. I can only assume as one of this season's youngest Jeopardy champions and by virtue of still being an undergrad that you must have had a similar watch party experience, no? Or am I mistaken and you kept it simple by watching your episodes with some close friends and family? I did have a watch party. It depends. It, like the days were different. I know that some of our friends from the JNCC had like actual like uh, campus like official parties with like just anyone invited. I didn't. I didn't like get that kind of publicity. I didn't seek it out, and I don't like you know how else would you get it? I guess. And they, and they obviously they don't promote the regular show like they would a primetime tournament. Um, so I wasn't. I didn't go to like administration and say like hey let's have a party because I wasn't necessarily like rep in UCLA. So yeah, I did. I did have like my friends come over and like at the bottom floor of my dorm we have a big lounge with a TV. Um, so we like hooked up a laptop with like HDMI and 
we just watched it and we had a bunch of people over and that was really fun. Oh, I don't remember which university, but we had a big basketball game that day too. So we watched it right after and we won, which was really fun after party in my room with uh, some closer friends. And then the next day, since that was our finals week, a lot of people had gone home already. So it was a little more intimate, uh, a little more of just the closer friends, but we did kind of the same thing. And then my Monday episode, I was actually in New York. I was visiting my uh, best friend who goes to Columbia. So me, him, and then one of our friends from middle school, actually, who goes to NYU, we uh, met up at this uh, nice restaurant, nicest restaurant, um, like downtown on the Hudson. And uh, we were able to sit outside and just stream it out there, uh, which was fun. It was really nice and just low key. And it was a good way to go out. That sounds great. Yeah. Was it your first time in New York or have you had you been there before? I- I had been uh, when I was 10 years old with my family for a couple of days. I think it was like President's Day weekend or something. And the only thing I really remember was like the uh, Egyptian stuff at the Met, um, which was really cool. But uh, I was able to spend a whole week there this time. And, you know, as an adult, it was definitely a much different experience, especially kind of solo traveling because like mm-hmm. I stayed in a hostel um, and I would hang out with like my uh, my friend a lot, but he sleeps late. So I got to do a lot of stuff by myself in the mornings. Um, so yeah, I loved it. What a, what a wonderful city. I'm sure you know that well. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so loyal listeners of the podcast are probably sick and tired of me asking the same question for every guest that's on the show, but I still like to use this one because every single time I get a different response. It's a short one, but it might require a long answer from you, Finn. Why Jeopardy? Did you grow up watching the show? Were you like a whiz kid in grade school? Is trivia a hobby for you? Tell us what motivated you to audition for Jeopardy. Yeah, I did grow up watching it at home with my with my parents and my sister. Uh, ever since I can remember, I don't even, I'm sure ever since I was born, really. My grandparents, who I spent a lot of time with, also love the show. So whenever I would, I would spend a lot of like time in the summer at their house. So we would watch it together too. Yeah, ever since I was a kid, I had been trying out. Like I tried out for the uh, kids tournament back when that was a thing couple times tried out for the teen tournament like twice i think tried out for college tournament obviously and then i think i also did the anytime test like two times or something and i always loved trivia too in high school i did a uh, quiz bowl and um i did like an academic decathlon thing in like middle school so i've always just kind of loved learning about random stuff especially like you know geography or movies or books and yeah it just it felt like it's just been a part of my I, it's just like it's hard to answer that because it's just been a part of my life for so long yeah i think i feel the same way it's and it's totally relatable in that regard that you know i just grew up watching this show loved watching it every night since like middle school i, I i've always been a curious person and i think it was just a natural next step to you know potentially see myself on the show so i think it just came with time i suppose this next question should be interesting given how things shook out for you what did your audition timeline look like? Did you take both the college and adult anytime tests at the same time? Did you have multiple tests over Zoom? Did you have more than one mock game and interview? And finally, what did the coveted text or call look like for being called in as an alternate versus being called in as a contestant? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's a little hard to answer because it was forever ago, but I believe I did audition for college and just the regular program around the same time of my freshman year so like last year the weird covid year maybe late 2020 early 2021 can't exactly remember and then i did you know make it to the zoom audition stage for both and then i never heard back for the anytime stuff like the actual program but i remember i think it was like my fall quarter here so probably around like october or something probably around the same time you guys were getting your calls mindy called me and I uh, was like, hey, like, it's not certain yet, but uh, we're, you know, strongly considering you to be an alternate um, for the college tournament. At first, I was kind of like, oh, man, like, can I actually go on? <laughs> you know, like, um, but like, uh, I wasn't like sad or anything. I was just like, okay, like, that's like, you know, slightly underwhelming. But then the more I thought about it, I was happier with it because I was like, man, like, college, like these kids are going to be like geniuses, like compared to me, because we got the Ivies and we obviously had people like Jess Carr. <laughs> so I was like, mm-hmm. I was like, I, this is going to be a tough, tough competition. I obviously, I didn't know any of you guys yet, but I was like, I was just thinking in my head, I was like, I'm sure it's gonna be a tough competition. Um, it's probably good that I sit this one out and just get the experience, you know, because when she was telling me like, how they comp the hotel and stuff, I was like, hey, this just sounds like a fun weekend in Culver City, make some new friends, you know, um, just get to see the behind the scenes process. So I was like, super, super happy being an alternate. And then especially when I like got comfortable information that I, I could go on the regular show later I was like oh like this just you know I get to procrastinate I get more time to prepare down the road and then you know who gets the Jeopardy experience twice you know like that was that was like so so fortunate so what happened was like my first week of winter quarter John the contestant producer texted me and was like hey like we have an opening tomorrow <laughs> I was like I was like oh my god I was like I 
yeah, I was like, yeah, like I've, I have like an exam. I don't even know if I did. I was just like too scared <laughs> to go on like the next day. And then he's like, okay, okay. We'll be in touch. Like no worries. And then the next week he's like, Hey, do you want to go on next week? And I was like, well, I can't keep saying no to this guy. You know, like I'm going to cancel one of my opportunity. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, sure. I got nothing going on. I'll go on next week. Uh, which is funny. Cause I think that for the regular program, they, they get the call a couple months in advance, obviously. Cause they have to, you know, yeah. most of them have to um, book airfare and uh, book the hotel and stuff. But since, since I'm local and since I kind of had the uh, back door of being the JNCC alternate, one of the JNCC alternates, it was a little more of a quick timeline. So I definitely was a little underprepared, but I guess it worked out. When Mike was on last episode, he said, well, he, Mike's from Astoria, New York. So uh, oh, yeah. he said when he got the call, it was about three weeks between when he got the call and when he actually flew out to LA. Oh, so, okay. So that's yeah. a little quicker than I thought it was for them. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you said you took both the college and adult, but didn't hear from the adult and, and you managed to get to, you know, the syndicated show by virtue of just, you know, being an alternate and them being able to, you know, hook you up and basically put you higher in the yeah. priority list. I remember when I was auditioning, I took both the college and adult anytime tests around the same time. And I got called in for both the college and adult. And mm -hmm. I guess I was in two separate contestant pools, one for college and one for adult. And it just so happened that the college one just came knocking on the door first. So that's the opportunity yeah. that I took. And that, I mean, the college tournament, like, it was so fun. You know, that was that was such a great weekend. What what a what an opportunity to be on primetime, right? Like, how do you feel yeah. about that? How do you feel about your primetime experience like, uh, on national television on that I, scale? I don't know. <laughs> um, It's all a big blur. I mean, it's been two months since my episodes aired. I mean, I'm still feeling the ripples, uh, ripple effect of that tournament because it's available on Hulu for anyone to watch at any time. Right, so yeah. You never know when somebody's going to, like, watch it and, like, tweet about it. I yeah, still show have, up in like, your mentions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have, like, a tweet deck column that has, like, hashtag college jeopardy or something that shows That's up funny. whenever somebody tweets about it. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting now that it's, like, up there for however long Hulu decides to keep it up and – I'm just glad everyone's able to watch it even after it's done airing. So, yeah. This is also interesting because it's a perfect lead-in to ask how you prepared for the show. As an alternate, <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not you'll be playing while you're there. So, I guess it becomes a question of how much do I really need to study, you know? So, let's start there. Between getting the notice of being an alternate for the JNCC and watching us tape that weekend, how much pre preparation did you do? None at all. <laughs> the real answer is nothing, because I, uh, I I knew my chances of actually getting on the JNCC were were pretty slim, mm. and I was I was like I wasn't rooting for that. I didn't I didn't want to be on. I, I didn't want one of you guys to get COVID and lose your you know golden ticket, like that. That'd be kind of cruel, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't prepare at all, especially because like that was fall quarter for me, and this that was my first quarter living at college. So I had a lot going on, a lot of adjustment, a lot of a lot of uh, you know social obligations and like meeting people and um, stuff and trying to figure out like how college actually worked in person. So yeah, I didn't prepare at all just because I, I, I made the calculation that like one, I didn't have a lot of time Two, it probably didn't seem necessary. Mm -hmm. And three, I was like, sure, like someone would like curb stop me there anyway. And I'm also just a, I'm a procrastinator just mm -hmm. naturally. So like I, like I was like, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll look at some things just in case like, you know, by the smallest margin of chance, I do get on the college tournament, but it ended up working out <laughs> that I didn't study anything <laughs> for that. Was there anything specific that you took away from that November weekend that helped you prepare for the syndicated show taping in January? That's a good question. I think that feeling just comfortable on the Sony lot helped, like being familiar with the surroundings, like knowing how like the Jeopardy stage was and how it was kind of cold, you know, and then like um, just knowing what the structure of the day looked like, just being prepared for that, I think might have just been psychologically a little bit like helpful mm -hmm. i guess i guess getting the whole spiel um from who did that like Lori, i think or was it laura i can't remember. i forget um <laughs> but yeah yeah but getting the whole like spiel about how like the actual gameplay works and how that like taping works i think just like yeah being familiar with the process just made it like less scary mm -hmm. or just more comfortable but you know i didn't i as an alternate we didn't get to uh practice on the buzz or anything at the jncc i never got to like stand at the podium during that weekend so i didn't like have uh, you know, any familiarity with actually buzzing in compared to the people I played against on the syndicated program. So, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was helpful psychologically, but in terms of actual like gameplay and strategy, um, which psychology is a big part of, but I, I don't think there was a, any advantage or anything there. That was actually going to be my next question. Did you get any rehearsal time? But as you just said, it doesn't sound like you did or were able yeah, to. Yeah, you know, not, not a JNCC. No. Hmm. 
What was the protocol if one of us was unable to play? Were you going to draw straws for who would get to replace us in the tournament? Because there were two other Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. There was uh, Curran and... Oh, my God. Why am I so bad Taylor. at names? Taylor, right. Taylor Osmond from UCSD. Yeah, I love Taylor. So, uh, yeah, I was just being stupid there. Yeah, I don't... I don't know, actually. I don't think they ever told us because it never became an issue. I don't know if it'd be drawing straws. Or I don't know if the producers had their weird secret wizardry backstage, like backstage about who they like to, you know, put on. I really hope to see both Taylor and Curran on soon because yeah, they're real cool too. people. And I'm, I'm sure they'll be great. So we'll have to look out for that. I'm sure they'll be on soon enough because they're both California locals too. Yeah, it was really exciting getting to root for you uh, during your run. All of us in the JNCC group chat were just like, let's go, Finn, like hardcore, like rooting for you. It was just so exciting. It felt <laughs> yeah, no, that was real yeah. sweet. I really appreciated that support. It meant a lot to me. So in terms of knowledge, did you make an effort to study one subject more than another for the syndicated show? Or did you try to cover all of your bases? Yeah, so I only had a week and I, you know, had assignments and, uh, you know, friends to hang out with and mm -hmm. movies to see and things like because I, I go to like a, usually like one or two movies per week. So I, I had like stuff to do i did try to focus some things because like i feel i wanted to study a little more obscure geography so i was doing a lot of like rivers and that didn't work out because i remember i got one about i think the ottawa river wrong but um and then i did also i made this whole list of uh cocktails uh in case like potent potables came up um because <laughs> i'm just like uh you know as a person who cannot go to bars or clubs or anything i'm not very familiar with uh, cocktail recipes so uh, and that worked out because I did get a French 75 question, but yeah, I just, I did not really have a whole lot of time to study. And so, yeah, I just, uh, that's like really the things I remember. I like, I just gave up on sports as I'm sure I don't know if you can relate, <laughs> but I'm sure a lot of, uh, Jeffrey contestants can relate to this because I don't hate sports. I, I do enjoy watching, uh, like soccer with my roommates and definitely college basketball, but like, I just, I've never growing up or even now been a huge like professional sports fan. Um, mm. so like, like any NFL NBA stuff was just kind of like hopeless. So I was like, I'm just going to just lose on those ones. I, I wouldn't be ashamed if I lost on those ones, you know? So yeah, I definitely didn't try to cover all my bases. Definitely did focus a couple things, but like, uh, there's only so much you can do in a week when you have other mm. things going on. Reason why I was laughing so hard is because of the stark contrast and responses between you, Kira, and Liz, who decided sports was a lost cause and decided not to really focus on that. Whereas Mike, who was on last episode, he's a sportscaster, so sports is like oh, his, yeah. his forte. So it's there, really there funny you that you bring that up. And in Kira's episode, when she was on the show with Kristen, we talked about how recently there's been a lot of uh, college students on the syndicated show. I mean, you, Kira... Reagan was on recently, I think uh, Andres from Cornell. Um, yeah. There's been a yeah, lot of college right. students recently. And we I mentioned how potent potables might be a tough category considering, uh, you know, your <laughs> relative age range. So, um, yeah, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that as well. Yeah, exactly. And Akira's so good. Oh, my gosh. What a, what a player. She was um, part of your taping cohort, right? Or was she? She was, yeah, which is funny, uh, which is really funny because um, Kristen told me to look out for her. But yeah, that was just a really funny, like, small world moment. And yeah, what a hell of a player she was. So it was really fun to, like, watch her. Because I stuck around for that whole tape day. I, I lost on the Monday episode. Mm. And then oh, yeah, um, yeah, for yeah. the for the syndicated program, it's because I did they do, like, six a day for JNCC? Yeah, they did do six it was something, a day. Yeah, it was yeah. something crazy like that. Um, so they, they just do a, a whole week on the syndicated uh, program. So five episodes. Um, so I lost on the Monday one. I stuck around, though, because I, I wasn't, like, super bummed about that. Because, um, you know, I, I'd done what I came to do and more. So um, I was like, that's oh, fun. You know, how, when, when am I going to be able to be on, like, a, you know, a, television lot like this in the future you know so i i stuck around and like it was real fun to watch her play and watch everyone else and yeah with college students it, it's cool that there's been a lot and i mean there's always a lot of grad students i feel like mm -hmm. um, i think nadege was but, one of them yeah nadege was a grad student she was really cool um because like marine biologist was like one of my dream jobs growing up so it was real fun to just kind of pick her brain about her research and stuff mm -hmm. but yeah it's and then um there's a lot of recent grads too i think uh me here was a recent grad i might be wrong about that but yeah so yeah, it was, it was definitely that tape, uh, both tape days were incredible, incredible people. But since I like didn't have a lot of pressure and I was able to stick around, uh, that one was super fun. That second one. I remember when the contestant zone went up for the week Kira's episodes aired, I was like, oh man, I really hope Finn gets Thursday so they could like play <laughs> each other. Cause that'd be so cool being with that loose association with the Jane. Oh yeah. Oh, that that would have been really fun. Um, yeah. That and how really often probably, do you get to see like me. two undergrads on the syndicated show? I can't remember. Oh yeah, I probably, probably competing against each other. Probably never. I don't like that might yeah. have happened before, but yeah, I'm sure. Probably it's yeah. There. What was a category you felt absolutely prepared for, and did it appear in one of your games? I don't know. I mean, because I feel like stuff that I like I care about. I got. I kind of mentioned earlier. Movies are a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. Huge movie fan. 
and uh i did get that like 90s movie category which was i was okay i i didn't get i I don't think i ran any categories i don't think i was that good at anything but um i did get a couple there well there was a history one that actually oh yeah the the ones that were bad it didn't work out for me were uh which is not your question (laughs) that's actually my next question Um, Um, okay yeah so we can because there's there's nothing that i really like super prepared for and didn't see so like Hmm. the stuff that i thought i'd be good at that just i totally flubbed for was uh Definitely the Irish last names one on St. Paddy's Day. Uh, as a very Irish person, as a like, I'm gonna second come back to that later. Irish actually, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. But yeah, so we'll talk about that in a sec. But yeah, that one was just terrible. And then um, the uh, there's like a historical groups one that I don't think I got a single question in, which is a history major is a little embarrassing because um, it was kind of a weird category. But the Latin American history one worked out for me, so you know, uh, you win some, you lose some. As I was saying, on the flip side, what's a category you struggled to get a grip on, or maybe one you just didn't bother to study, and did that come back to bite you at all during your run? I probably, in hindsight, uh, I probably should have studied music a little more because I am a big music fan. Um, I go to a lot of shows and like uh, I like a lot of kind of variety of music. Uh, so the Tony Bennett one, because I, I was kind of confident about it. I wasn't confident about it because I don't listen to a whole lot of like strictly pop music per se, mm-hmm. but I was like pop singers like this is something that i'm at least like a, an area that i'm like familiar with but uh yeah so i kind of wish i would have studied that more but the, uh, the odds that i would have gotten like gotten to like tony bennett or something probably first then so and i was ready to go out then anyway so yeah nothing really came back to bite me the irish last name is one is funny though because uh i saw that and i was like oh let's go like i'm super irish i have a hella irish name and it was just like all old idioms and stuff like it was it was like stuff that i just was not familiar with except for i think like murphy bed or something but i didn't like buzz in time so yeah that was a a little little sad <laughs> but everything else was fine you know it's hard to i'm sure i'm sure you relate to this too but it's hard to remember the the details of the taping process because mm-hmm. you're just like such on this like adrenaline rush yeah. and um you just focused on the game and it just is a blur you know so I, I the only things I remember are kind of like I remember like I saw it when we actually like watched the episodes air and then I like had a memory come back to me of like taping it but if you asked me that question two days after taping I would probably just have nothing to say <laughs> oh don't worry I'll be able to jog your memory later when we break down each of your games individually <laughs> oh for sure for yeah. sure <laughs> after getting a few different guests on the show and getting to hear their perspectives I'm really curious to know Finn about the relationship you had or have with your contestant cohort Kira and Mike, who I've mentioned previously were on the podcast and appeared on the syndicated show, had opposite experiences when it came to keeping in touch with their taping groups. I remember Kira saying that it wasn't until the week her group's episodes started airing that they managed to reconnect on social media and start a group chat, while Mike said they really haven't interacted much since taping in late January. Which group was easier to get to know people, the 36 of us in the JNCC or your contestant cohort? And do you still talk to anyone from either group today? Yeah, so I think that it was easier with J and CC just because we're probably slightly more attuned to social media just due to our age. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we did have this weird bonding experience that's definitely not like the the regular program Mm -hmm. that, you know, we all stayed in the same hotel Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. we, you know, would go to dinner together and uh, we had multiple days to really kind of get to know each other. And we probably, you know, had more similar life experiences because we're all college students, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's easier definitely to get closer with and stay in touch with JNCC just because of those factors. I, I still loved all the people I, I uh, competed against and um, taped with for my two tape days for the syndicated program. So what I said about JNCC isn't to like discount that experience at all. Because mm, um, we do with my second tape day with Kira and all those folks, we do have like a Twitter group chat that's just for that tape day. So we're definitely all, I think, most if not all people are in there i don't know if everyone is but then with the uh there's, we don't have that for the uh for my first tape day but i, I definitely do am I'm like mutuals with a lot of those folks on twitter so hmm. so yeah everyone's kind of around but i'd say that like the j and cc cohorts probably a little more active and closer in in keeping in touch hmm. So between having conversations with others on the same tape day as you and watching the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday games from the audience, were you able to get a feel for who you were going up against? Were you able to identify some strengths and weaknesses of your competitors? And did any of that information affect your strategy at all before stepping up to the podium? Not necessarily. I mean, everyone there was just super smart, um, super friendly, super well put together. You know, if anything, just how cool everyone was (laughs) made me feel bad (laughs) and made me scared. I I don't remember like fearing any specific person yeah it did it definitely didn't affect strategy for me at least i don't know did you feel that way about jncc like did like when it was announced who you'd be 
um, playing against, like, did that impact your gameplay at all or how you approached that match? I definitely felt, well, so I taped on the second day of the quarterfinals, and after getting to know everyone that weekend and spending some time with people on the Wheel of Fortune stage, I knew that I really didn't feel like going up against Raymond, Megan, <laughs> yeah, yeah. or Sebastian. And unfortunately, I did get Raymond in my quarterfinal, but yeah. the odds were pretty high that I get one of them because as more people began like taping in groups of three, I started thinking about who was left or who was left to tape. And I'm like, oh God, uh, they're left. So uh, the odds are pretty high that I'll play at least one of them in my quarterfinal. And yeah, I mean, Raymond was just like on it while we were like watching oh, yeah. the quarterfinals from the Wheel Fortune stage on those small monitors. So um, I was definitely intimidated by the fact that not only was he a, a part-time librarian, I believe, but also yeah. the fact that he's, you know, a geospatial sciences major. And that sounds something that sounds pretty intimidating. I've never heard of that major until oh, I yeah. got there. So, yeah, I, I definitely felt a bit scared. But I once I grounded myself and realized that there's only so many factors that I can control. Yeah. And my opponents weren't one of them. So I just focused on what I could control, which was the categories I had at hand and, you know, my buzzer ability, which... To be fair, it wasn't the best, but you know, I, I made. The oh, it's hard way. though. It's hard, yeah. But the buzzer is is real hard. I mean, you can't. It's it's impossible to break down. You know what percentage of the gameplay is like dependent on the buzzer, but it's it's just so central to everything you do that like, I, I don't know if you had a similar experience, but the and we'll talk. Well, I'm sure you have questions about the buzzer. Oh yeah, later, it's actually like, my next question. <laughs> oh, okay, so we can just lead into that then. Yeah, we'll let's let's that. talk about the enigmatic Jeopardy buzzer. Pulling up your stats in front of me across your three games, you had an impressive buzz percentage of sixty four percent. Meaning did that, I actually? Yeah, you did. Meaning that I, I didn't look at my box scores because they—it's oh, really? all, all Greek to me. I don't, I don't know <laughs> uh, strategy and math like that. Sixty-four percent means that for those listening who don't know, Finn was buzzing in first on sixty-four percent of the clues he attempted to answer. Now everyone has different approaches when it comes to timing their buzz, but Finn, I'd really like to know what your strategy was. Did you base your timing on the host Ken Jennings' cadence, or did you prefer using the lights surrounding the clue board as a visual cue to buzz in? Also, if you had a preferred buzzer hold or grip i'd love for you to share that as well i knew you were gonna ask this and i was really <laughs> thinking about it yeah i honestly again like i said earlier it's so hard to remember things from from those days i think they went on lights i i can't say that with absolute certainty um but that just seems like something i would do and seems like something i did do I, i'm just i'm not entirely sure though i'm sure it was like a combination of both and with the buzzer hold i think i just held it in front of me and you know um, I think sometimes you I leaned think, over I, the podium at some. Point. I was gonna say I was I was I was about to say that yeah I think I do remember kind of leaning against the podium and having it kind of raced there, but I, it was just with with when to buzz and how to buzz and stuff. It was just what felt natural and comfortable in the moment. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't a whole lot of strategy in what I was doing um, because I'm just not strategic. I'm the worst chess player you'll ever meet. <laughs> um, I that's just not that's just not how my brain works. I did study and it was funny because I'll, I'll tell the story in a sec. But I did study the final Jeopardy wagering strategy because i knew that like that's something i would totally flub if i didn't know what i was doing so i did study that like you know the cover bets and stuff which is funny because like for most people or at least a lot of math brain people like that's just intuitive it's just that's mm -hmm. the obvious thing to do because i was talking to a grad student i know here who was actually on wheel of fortune like way back in the day mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about this experience over some bagels and i was explaining that and he's like I didn't even like get to like the cover bets and stuff. He was like, Oh, what did you do this, this, and this? Cause he's like an aerospace engineer. Mm. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what you do. And like, that's crazy that you just came up with that. Like we're thinking about it for two seconds. Cause I had to like read this whole breakdown, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, other than that, not too much strategy going on. So yeah, it was just whatever felt comfortable and natural. What was working in the moment. If something wasn't working, I guess I just got rid of it. You know, I assume studying the buzzer or maybe reading the book Secrets of the Buzzer wasn't part of your prep process before getting on the show? No, I, I didn't read any of those like Jeopardy books that a lot of contestants seem to like. And I'm sure they're really worthwhile. I just, again, I had one week. So by the time mm -hmm. it got here with Prime or whatever, it, it probably would have been too late anyway. And as a history major, I have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of class readings to do. Like I read so much in a week that um, sitting down with a, a book for pleasure otherwise can be challenging sometimes we'll get into final jeopardy wagering strategy later when we break down your individual games but mm -hmm. for me i also made a big deal of making final jeopardy wager strategy part of my prep process but obviously that didn't really matter in the end considering raymond had a runaway i could only <laughs> you know do the calculations to improve my chances of getting second 
But um, yeah, I remember I was sitting in my hotel room that weekend with a bunch of flashcards. I looked up the most recent games on J-Archive, and I was literally prepared for any situation I would be in, assuming that I had a chance to get first. And yeah, I, I just felt super prepared in that regard, but unfortunately it didn't pan out the way I wanted it to. Yeah, it, it was all really interesting. I, I really... I really applied myself to make sure that I knew the ins and outs and knew what certain wagers or what certain like, you know, thresholds meant in terms mm -hmm. of like doing the math. And I got really quick at it too. I managed to do the That's good. the calculated wagers for all three players within three minutes, the max. So Damn, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I remember there was, there was one game where I was definitely taking a long time on the flashcard, just double checking my math and stuff because mm. I'm just so bad at math. I'm just awful at math. So yeah, that was definitely, and I mean, you can see that, and we'll talk about this, I'm yeah. sure, in a mm -hmm. second, but um, definitely was getting a little flack on Reddit for my uh, daily double lack of strategy in my, I guess, conservative or random wagers with that. Because <laughs> in the moment, I was just like, oh, $2,000 sounds like enough or whatever, you know, like I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about what it would do for me, you know, it was just like, oh, this number is a nice even number that, <laughs> you know, would be a substantial amount of money in the real world. <laughs> So Ken was the host for all three of your games, but you also got to watch Mayim in action during the JNCC. I don't know if you paid much attention to her while we were taping, but in any case, did you notice any differences between Mayim and Ken's hosting styles? Did you prefer one host over the other? I don't necessarily prefer one. I'm glad I'm glad that I got to see both. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that Ken was mine just because I had seen Mayim already. Because like, you know, meeting Ken as any lifelong Jeopardy fan, that's that's a dream come true, right? Mm -hmm. Like the go you, like you, it doesn't get better than that uh but mime is wonderful i, I i'm sure uh and i'd be interested to hear in a sec like uh, your experience playing with her but um just watching her she was very uh very friendly it seemed like very warm very professional especially when that monitor broke down one day and she was just <laughs> um really kind of you know uh talking to everyone in the audience and just being like real cool like i i really enjoyed watching mime do her job uh just from afar there and I really enjoyed playing under Ken, though. So I don't necessarily prefer one. And I definitely don't want to wade into the whole host debate because that's that's a, kind of a heinous thing online mm -hmm. um, that I don't particularly care about. Yeah, I mean, I agree. like as a fan of the show, obviously I care. But I think that both Mime and Ken and I'm sure some of the other names being floated um, would do a wonderful job. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just glad that I got to experience both, you know. In terms of my experience with Mayim, uh, we mentioned this on the po on previous podcast episodes, but the time we get with the host is actually quite brief. When you're up there, right, that's pretty course. much the only time when you get to talk to the host. You know, during your contestant interview and perhaps during the overheard segments, which in my mm -hmm. case aired actually, which I was pleasantly surprised by. We talked about Final Jeopardy, how that was the first game or first game in the entire tournament out of two, I believe, that all three contestants got Final Jeopardy correct. So we were just talking about like. Uh, the way we thought about it, you know, how we went from how maybe Lucy was thinking about Schrodinger versus, you know, Heisenberg, talk about Schrodinger's cat. And then afterwards, this is when it caught off. We talked about um, my contestant story and talked about Mr. Philippines and like the whole thing about right, that. Because you had the, 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 the Filipino, Filipino clue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we talked more about that because um, Mayim seemed particularly interested uh, during my contestant interview. So we talked more about that. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite brief. Um, Mayim was uh, great to talk to. I wish we got to talk to her more. But overall, it was just a pleasant experience. Um, yeah. How about with Ken? Uh, did you get to talk to him outside your contestant interview uh, or maybe during the overheard segments? Yeah, it, it was the same thing you said. It was just the contestant interview and the uh, overheard uh, segments. And then, you know, they whisk him away to his dressing room. Because <laughs> um, I'm sure his job is very exhausting. And they have to, you know, do the wardrobe changes and stuff. So, yeah, it's the same thing. You, you don't really interact with the host outside of what you see on tv pretty much uh, but yeah that, that was like you said that's the extent of your interaction with the host pretty much yeah i can't remember if any overheard segments have made it to the syndicated show i can only remember i can only remember the overheard segments being posted on the official jeopardy youtube channel so maybe right, it was just something right. unique to the jncc to fill you know airtime for prime time or whatever i think so yeah uh, speaking of contestant stories, you were able to share three of them with us. Your first one was about baby whale watching in Baja, California. Your second was about your undergrad at UCLA, as well as your interest in becoming a park ranger. And your third was about owning a vintage Audubon guide. What were some other stories that didn't make it to air or ones that you would have used had you gone on to play one or two more games? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I don't know. I mean, I don't live a super interesting life necessarily. <laughs> so I definitely would have become a struggle at a certain point. One thing I did remember, like, that, um, I don't know if they would have let me because it didn't, it didn't come up yet, but I was thinking, like, if I did win that game and I got another one, <laughs> I, I, I would want to talk about my uh, my pet bunnies 
uh because they're very dear to my heart and I, it's not like an uncommon pet but it's definitely less common than like a cat or dog so maybe mm-hmm. they would have let me do it but my family is like we're uh we got rabbits during the pandemic that summer like summer of 2020 and they have just really kind of taken over our life in our house because so they don't like live in a cage or anything they have a little pen they sleep in at night but they they're just all about the house throughout the day and they are just like the funniest little animals so uh i definitely would have liked to talk about them because they're very dear to me um other than that i can't remember what i had on the sheet because i mean obviously there were things there i do have like random hobbies or things i do like i it's kind of pretentious to say but like my religion is like movies like i go to the movie theater <laughs> at least once a week it's like going to church for me like because uh, like living in la there's so many awesome like independent like art house theaters here mm. i mean even just in westwood where ucla is we have like four theaters like it's crazy yeah so i probably maybe i would have talked about that because I've, I've seen a lot of like uh directors and actors do q a so i've seen a lot of like really mm. cool people talk about their work so that would have been fun to talk about maybe and then I have other random collections. I collect like vinyl too, like any pretentious 20 year old. Um, <laughs> I, I collect a lot of books, like, like the Audubon guide, but I also just like buy a lot of random books around town. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, stuff like that. But I... As of recording this episode, Easter is coming up this weekend. Do you have anything planned to do with your, your rabbits? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, for anyone who's listening, just a slight PSA, uh, in the rabbit community, Easter is actually a very sad day because uh, oh. a, lot of, a lot of families adopt rabbits on easter as like a cute little gift for their kids and then they realize that it's actually a pretty care intensive animal um and they end up just like dumping them in parks or whatever because they're like oh, oh bunnies so can just sad. go live in the wild and it's really sad because we actually um uh, our rabbits are, are rescues you know so like we've seen firsthand the effects of like dumping on, on those animals and it's, it's just really sad and like easter is a bad time because a lot of people just adopt it and neglect or uh, abuse or just throw away rabbits after easter when they realize oh it's not just a cute little fluffy thing you can hold that it you know takes a lot of work and that they're, they're not always fun you know yeah so psa to anyone listening do not adopt a rabbit on easter unless you're prepared for an actual long-term uh care intensive commitment to an animal um, it is worthwhile but you just have to be prepared for it but yeah easter no i sadly i'm not going home for easter um i'm not I, it's, it's, it's exciting it's, it's like my roommate and my good friend's um birthday so we're gonna be celebrating that um up here but uh, I definitely will be going home soon and spending a lot of time with my bunnies um, because I miss them very much. I never knew about that, about Easter and rabbits. That's that's crazy. Um, thank you for yeah, doing that. Yeah. Moving on, it's time for us to get into the nitty gritty and break down each of your games individually, starting with your debut episode against Katie and Joel. I have here written in my notes that in the Jeopardy round, you nearly swept the category circumflexing on you, answering four out of the five clues correctly. Which turned out to be a category all about French vocabulary, something I would have never picked up on, on until a clue was read. Was yeah, studying... I did not pick up on that either, which I probably should have. Because um, the circumflex is like the little triangle over the um, O and the E, I think, usually in French. Oh, um, really? I never knew that. Yeah. I never knew those words. Yeah, but... circumflex in French or circumflex in English, I guess. Yeah. Uh, studying... It's like a little, I don't know what the name grammatically is for that, but yeah. Was studying French vocabulary part of your prep process, or do you have some background in French that allowed you to get those clues with ease? Yeah, no, I took I took four years of French in high school, oh, wow. um, so that's basically what it was. <laughs> it, was it was pretty basically basic vocabulary. I think like window was a question. So it's like stuff that you cover in like French one. Yeah, so I, I have not been studying French in college, unfortunately, but I am studying abroad in Paris this summer. Although I don't practice it as much as I should, I. I stay on top of it from time to time especially since i'm going to paris so it was just one of those things that like i knew that i just got lucky ended up coming up in the game so going back to irish name derivations were you just unfamiliar with those clues or were katie and joel just a wee bit quicker on the buzzer there were somewhere i think there, i think there was a murphy bed one which you know i is pretty common knowledge so i think they were quicker on that there was a lot of them that i just at least in my memory of the category were just kind of like random like kind of old person and not that katie and joel are old at all but like like you know older like a little more old-fashioned like idioms you know mm. that i just you know maybe knew but just wouldn't have been able to come up with because it's definitely not my daily speech yeah i just couldn't connect the dots on that one you know which is embarrassing because i'm i'm actually working on getting my irish citizenship right now so maybe they'll, oh, that's, maybe they'll that's deny cool. me or something <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll look up your episode and be like nope this they're like no he's not, not a, he's not a true irishman yeah. <laughs> so according to the official box score published on jeopardy's website there were a total of 18 triple stumpers or clues no one attempted that's to right in on that's right which is why it wasn't until the tail end of double jeopardy that someone someone being you finn broke the ten thousand <laughs> that excuse me ten thousand dollar mark 
Did you three have any discussion afterwards about the difficulty of the clues? Were they in categories you were just unfamiliar with? Or did you hesitate on some and decide it wasn't worth the risk? Yeah, I don't think we really talked about it because, you know, when you're like on the on the syndicated program, when you're like the, you know, returning champ or whatever, they just kind of whisk you away. And then mm -hmm. they like, because they, they got to get you changed. They see if you like need water snacks or whatever. And then they, and then John comes up and you discuss your, uh, your, your next story, you know, so there's a lot of stuff to do. So I didn't really have a chance to really debrief with Katie and Joel, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it was just a weird board that wasn't really playing to my strengths. I think that was probably it. Mm -hmm. And I think that I do remember at least before the first commercial break in the, in the contestant stories that, and I've talked to, I've talked to other people in like my contestant pool and stuff, and they had similar experiences where like, it's just hard to get a hang of the buzzer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just such a weird experience, you know, taping a game show. Mm -hmm. um, so like before that first commercial break, it just like, it just felt bad. It was like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm failing. Like, this is awful. Like I'm going to lose, but you know, that's okay. But like, and then I think once you kind of get over that hump and you just get into the groove then it's a little more smooth sailing. Um, so I think at least in the beginning, that's maybe where some of the triple stumpers came from is just the hesitation and the weirdness of the, that first couple minutes. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it was just a weird board probably. The final Jeopardy category for this game was nonfiction, and the answer was Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. I noticed on J Archive that you had initially crossed it out as your response, but then rewrote it. Were you hesitant in writing down your response, or did you just want to fix your penmanship? Because I know the touch input of the light pen isn't the best. Yeah, Silent Spring was the only answer in my head. I, I didn't know for sure, um, but it was I was just like mid-century, like ecological, like impending doom book. Silent Spring seemed like the only like plausible answer that I could come up with. I think I just crossed it out because I had written it poorly or I didn't have enough room for the whole word or something. Yeah. So game two against Deborah and Michael, I don't really have anything in my notes about any specific categories or clues, but it was another close game with yet another razor thin margin separating you right, in second right. place going into final. In fact, you ended with the same score going to final as with your first game, 10,800. Did I actually? Yeah, you did. The final Jeopardy category for this game was newspaper talk and the correct response was lead oh, yeah. spelled L E D E. All of you were correct, and you went on to become a two-day Jeopardy champion. A few questions for you, Finn. First, was this an instant get for you, or was lead a word you had to rack your brain for? Uh, no, no, it was instant, because I, I did newspaper in high school. Um, mm. And uh, it was actually really, that was one of the highlights of high school for me, um, because I was like an editor-in-chief my senior year for our online newspaper, and I made a lot of good friends through that program, and we got to like travel across the country for like uh, student journals and conventions and stuff. So that was instant for me. Um, especially because I love my my newspaper advisor and I still talk to her from time to time. Um, so I was really excited because her husband had actually been on Jeopardy. Oh, wow. So I was really excited to like, uh, like when it was airing to like get her reaction from that. So yeah, lead was an instant get just because I'm familiar with like the newspaper jargon and stuff. Next, in that moment, how did it feel knowing that you won not just one, but two games of Jeopardy? Did you have any expectations for yourself prior to filming? And if so, did you surpass those expectations? Uh, no, I just wanted to go there to have a good time, honestly, because... Um, because like we said at the beginning of the episode, it is such an accomplishment. Not, I'm not tuning my own corner here. I'm just talking about everyone who has been a contestant, like mm. to get on the show, you know? So that was like, that was all I needed. I was like, I'm on Jeopardy. I'm going to be on Jeopardy. Like this has been a dream for my, like most of my like conscious life. Like I, like I've done everything I needed to do. And like, as long as I don't just like completely embarrass myself up there, like we're good to go. So I, I did not, I certainly did not expect to win. Cause I thought that the like generational gap between me and most of the other contestants mm. would have done me in. So, and especially since I just didn't have much time to prepare. So I, I did not expect to win. So that was, that was crazy. That was like, I remember like calling my parents uh, when I was walking out of the, the Sony lot at the end of that tape day, just, just like, just being elated, you know, just not understanding what had just happened. Like it just, I couldn't comprehend, I was just like smile. I couldn't comprehend it, you know, like, uh, cause it was like a dream come true. You know, it was, it was like probably one of my biggest life dreams and I had achieved it in a really like cool way. So like, I was just, uh, I was just over the moon and I just remember my parents were really super excited too and my sister. So, uh, so yeah, it was just, that was, that was real fun. But that night though, um, a little bit of a come down. Cause I was like, Holy crap. Like I need more outfits because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a history major. I'm not really like doing crazy internships or job interviews or anything, especially since I'm a sophomore. So the nicest piece of, I didn't even have like nice clothes up here. I just, I just wear like t-shirts and jeans all day. Uh, I had to go to Target and like buy more dress shirts and sweaters. Uh, <laughs> so that was kind of a like, hey, you had, behind you had the some scenes, money to like, spend my wedding on. So. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how you mentioned the generation gap and kind of described it as a sort of disadvantage because when Mike was on, he kind of 
described as an advantage because uh, Mike's 36 and his opponents mm-hmm. were much younger than him. I think Reagan was like 19 and Mateo is like 23. So his ref- he admitted that his reflexes weren't necessarily the best. He was the weakest out of the three on the buzzer. And so, really? yeah, he felt like that being young was an advantage and that you're able to get in quicker on the buzzer. I mean, there are some advantages on going on the show early, um, you know, being in your undergrad. I think the minimum age to be on the syndicated show is 18. So probably if you're holding out on being on Jeopardy because you feel like your life experience like isn't enough. Um, just ignore all that. Um, just oh definitely yeah i would definitely give that advice no expectations and just going confident knowing that you know what you know and you know what you don't yeah exactly like it's just so fun and like even like clout worthy or whatever to just be on the show so like Mm -hmm. if you get the call just go just go just keep trying out and just go there yeah there definitely are advantages to being young Uh, i don't know like if the reflex thing is necessarily universal but Mm -hmm. there's probably truth to that and uh they do throw a lot of kind of random pop culture questions and there was there was that among us question a couple of days ago so <laughs> yeah, that I mean, was actually on uh, Mike's episode yeah we talked about yeah that. yeah exactly yeah so um just for as many advantages as older people get i'm sure younger people get theirs too so um so yeah if anyone who's listening to this is like uh someone our age who um is hesitant to try out because of their age just go for it who cares you know it's gonna be fun either way so for those listening who don't know we alluded to it earlier jeopardy tapes five games per day so a week's worth of games twice a week and because finn's first two games aired on a thursday and a friday that meant he taped his third game the following day which eventually aired on a monday if that sounded Mm -hmm. confusing for you i'm basically saying between finn's second and third games he had a night to sleep so Finn, you talked. <laughs> I don't about know if it. I actually said that. Yeah. <laughs> so Finn, you talked about it a little bit already. What else did you do after you finished taping that first day? Did you go out to eat and celebrate? I know you said you called your parents to tell them how you did. Uh, and did you get to take some time to reflect upon the day and collect your thoughts before going into that second day of taping? Yeah. So they tell you that you are allowed to talk about the results with people that would have been in the studio with you. Mm. So you get like a small pool of like people who are you know like close friends or family mm. uh, that you can tell. I remember I I think I just Ubered back because because I because Westwood is like on a good day, like 15 minutes from Culver City. It's not far. Uh, so, yeah, I just Ubered back to my dorm and I, I and my roommate was there and I was like, you can't tell anyone. But um, I just won Jeopardy. <laughs> so so we had like a fun little debrief. And then I was like, holy, holy crap. I like I need more outfits. So I just like went around to a couple different targets on the West side, just trying to find like sweaters and stuff. But yeah, I got a couple things at Target and then I came back to Westwood, which I've said that a couple times. If anyone's not familiar with LA geography, that's the neighborhood that UCLA is in. I actually did treat myself because there is this, um, there's this like sandwich spot that's open late night. It's real good. It's called Fat Sal's. It's like an LA thing. And the sandwiches are a bit pricey, but I was like, I just want Jeopardy. I can get like a a good sandwich, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so I had my Fat Sal sandwich and then I came back. And I tried desperately to go to bed, but I wasn't very successful at that. Um, especially since I had to wake up because I the tape, I don't I think I had to be at the Sony lot by like seven. Yeah, you got to be there day. early for your call. No, I had to get up to like because I'm like a morning shower. So I had to get up to like shower and to like get my outfit on and to pack my suitcase with like the extra clothes and to call the Uber. And so, yeah, it was like a whole thing. So, yeah, I definitely did not sleep too much. And I think that I don't know. It's hard. I would have lost that monday game no matter what because the tony bennett um clue just was not something i knew Mm -hmm. um but i do think that the monday episode was difficult i think it was difficult doing the monday episode so i think that didn't help you know Mm -hmm. yeah especially if you're coming off the heels of one taping day and then you gotta you know reassess everything the next taping day and get into the groove of things so i definitely feel like going to that monday game it's rough for a returning champion did you get to go to the in and out on Venice at all? Because I know a lot of. Uh, <laughs> I've actually never been to that in and out. Yeah, it's funny. I think I um, I did, I've never been to that in and out on Venice. I know that's like a Jeopardy staple. Um, yeah. Because I just wanted to get back to Westwood. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Culver City's awesome. I mean, you know Culver City. Culver City's yeah. a real cool neighborhood. Uh, right, it's actually just a city. It's not. Is it usually that quiet? Because um, I remember in November it was really quiet in the area. Um, I don't spend a whole lot of time in Culver City. I mean, it's close to me, but I just like. I don't have much reason to go there. Mm. I don't know. I think it's kind of happening on the weekend nights because there's that, I don't remember the name of the street, but there's that street that's blocked off with all the restaurants. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's there's definitely a younger crowd there. So um, I think it's like a low-key kind of happening vibe there. 
but i'm sure that in and out gets crazy oh, yeah. um because literally every in and out just is insane <laughs> like you can put it in and out in the middle of nowhere there's still gonna be a huge line but we actually we have an in and out in westwood too and i mean growing up in san diego in and out has just always been part of my life so uh so it, it didn't have like the novelty because i know that a lot of jeopardy contestants come from out of state so they, yeah the in and out on venice is like their first taste of it or it's like something that they have to do so yeah i just i didn't have that same need because like i go to in and out like once a week anyways <laughs> you know understandable yeah Game three, your game against Margaret and Karen. Again, I don't have any notes about any particular categories or clues, but I did write a summary of the game dynamics for our listeners. After the Jeopardy round, Margaret was in the lead with $3,800, but once Karen hit the first daily double in Double Jeopardy, she made a moderate wager, which paid off, giving her a significant lead. However, Karen plateaued for a bit for about 13 clues, which allowed Finn and Margaret to make up some ground. Though, once she found her groove again, Karen managed to widen the gap and capitalize on the last remaining daily double of the round. Interestingly enough, Karen actually had the worst buzz percentage of the three of you at 38% for the entire game, but she managed to make up for it in the form of those daily doubles, allowing her to maintain her lead going into final. Unlike in Finn's previous games, he was in second going into Final Jeopardy behind Karen by $4,000 and above Margaret by a mere $1,600, which made for a very interesting wagering scenario. Now, before I dive into some game theory for our listeners, I, know, I mean, Finn, like you mentioned previously, you studied Final Jeopardy wagering strategy, but was it as intensive as, I guess, I did uh, it while I was in my hotel room, or did you binge a couple No, definitely years? not. I just uh, I just found that website that broke it down. It's one of the main Jeopardy websites. I don't remember the name. And then I just kind of like wrote it down in my notebook and I was just looking at it. But I remember for that game, my wagering strategy went out the window because um, I was like, I was like, man, like the difference between second and third here is not much because it's two thousand one thousand dollars, you know. And like uh, I was like, I've already won my game, so I don't care if I get second or third. So I wasn't gonna. And I was like, pop singers. It's like gonna be one of those things where I either know it or don't. And like. I guess, yeah, because betting at all was a really stupid strategy. Um, and there was really, like, I don't think there would be any, like, gain to that. I could have probably gamed it, like, that if we all got it wrong, I could have come out on top or something. Because I knew I knew Karen was definitely going to do the cover bet. And then I don't remember how Margaret bet, but I'm sure there would be a strategy. I, I just wasn't thinking about that because I was like, I already had my experience. I was like, it's pop singers. I like music. Let's just throw, let's just throw it all at the wall and see what sticks. And, yeah, and I don't regret it because I, I would have lost that game no matter what because, obviously – uh, Margaret got it right and there's no way I it, that's one of those clues that it's like you could lock me in a room for 10 hours and I never would have come up with it mm. it makes sense in hindsight because the whole Tony Bennett like Lady Gaga thing like I know who he is but like yeah. um, I never would have come up with his name in that moment there was definitely less strategy in that moment but it, it didn't matter yeah i thought it was a pretty good guess despite the flack you got on social media you know oh you yeah rocks. you see i was on like the today show did you see that oh really um, i didn't see that they, no. they didn't inter- no they, they had like a little segment they're like jeopardy contestants have embarrassing thing and then they apologized to dan what? Russell, but like, i didn't see I had, that. like I a bunch of like older up. family members or like family friends the kind of people who were watching the today show in the morning in the middle <laughs> of the week who who would like text me or text my mom and be like oh my god Finn was on the today show and i was like i was in like the new york post the huffington <laughs> post like like, yeah it was it was funny um i didn't care i mean like i think miss ross has a bigger fish to fry i don't even know i hope she's not aware of it but uh i i, I would hate to offend her because she is such a legend and i knew it wasn't her i knew she was not like 95 years old or how old tony that it was but as, as a contestant you know it's like you just got to write something you yeah. know uh and that was like the one name that was in my head i was like i know she's still active so we'll just see what happens <laughs> i still thought she was a decent choice i mean i didn't come up with tony bennett watching it from my couch um, like you said earlier, if you recalled Lady Gaga did an album with Tony Bennett, you could probably, you know, connected the dots. But I still yeah. thought it was a good guess, all things considered. And you said you thought that wagering at all was like not the play, but actually mathematically it does make a lot of sense. So, oh, does it actually? Yeah, it does. So I'm about to explain Finn's wagering predicament in Final Jeopardy and the options he had from a mathematical standpoint. So if that doesn't sound, or rather, if that sounds boring or it doesn't interest you in the slightest, I've provided timestamps in the episode description <laughs> to tell you when i'm finished rambling and when our next topic begins i'll give you folks listening some time to find it real quick great if you're still here thank you while i was studying for the jncc uh like i mentioned earlier i made a real effort to understand the ins and outs of final jeopardy wagering so i'm glad i get to talk about it here with finn on post podium okay so Finn finds himself in second going into final and in what's colloquially known as Stratton's Dilemma, named after two-day champion Ted Stratton, who appeared on the syndicated show back in 2005. First, Finn's win condition depends on Karen getting final wrong. If Karen gets final right, assuming she wagers to cover Finn's doubled score, she wins. No doubt about that. 
Second, I want you listening to this episode to picture a number line before I explain this next part, because I think it'll be easier to understand. Good? Okay. So, on the higher end, Finn's choices of wagers are $8,201 or more. On the lower end, Finn's choices of wagers are $1,599 or less. $8,201 or more allows Finn to cover Margaret's doubled score should both of them get final right. However, this comes with some risk. If Finn gets final wrong, in most cases, Margaret would win the game, such as when no one is correct, or if she's the only one correct in final. If Finn is expecting no one to get final right, i.e. a triple stumper, he can choose to go small and wager at most $15.99. Why $15.99? Because in the event of a triple stumper, he'd beat Margaret by at least $1. This is also a risky wager because if both Finn and Margaret get final correct, Margaret could surpass Finn and win the game if she makes a big enough wager or decides to go all in. What actually happened was that Margaret was the only one who got final correct, but had Finn also been correct, he would have won the game because he bet everything. So, in hindsight, it actually wasn't that uh, crazy of a wager because you were in a situation where you had to either bet zero or bet it all. Mm -hmm. And it sounded, yeah, yeah, based on what you said, I guess you went in with it with a more go big, go home sort of mentality rather than it being a more calculated wager, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was it was the vibe, you know. Yeah, it was the vibe. <laughs> I was just feeling the vibe. I was feeling the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to Diana Ross, uh, I know she's on Twitter, and well, I don't know if she manages her account personally. Did uh, did she re- react to your response at all? I know Tony Bennett. I, I didn't see that. I I haven't logged into my Jeopardy Twitter account uh, in a minute. I should probably go just see what's going on in that that whole scene but uh no i didn't see anything from from diana ross on her account i didn't i probably would have heard about it if i did so I, yeah I, I think like i said i think she just has bigger fish to fry she like you know one of the uh, greatest artists of all time like you know she's got she's got a lot going on i don't think she's worried about us mere peasants you know uh, <laughs> thinking she's a little older than she is but yeah no, that would that would have been really embarrassing but like i because i didn't care about the media coverage because it was like one day and it's like mm-hmm. you know if that's what the mob comes for me, um, then I'm pretty lucky. So yeah, I, I thought it was funny more than anything. But if I actually did hear from Diana Ross, I would have been truly embarrassed. So um, so yeah, it worked out. That's all I have regarding your games. Moving away from that, let's revisit your contestant experience. Was there any aspect of this journey, either as an alternate or as a contestant, that surprised you in any way? Or maybe anything that you weren't expecting that caught you off guard? Um, I guess just how it all played out. Because like, if you had asked me like before all this, like, do you think you'll get on Jeopardy in your life? I would, I probably would have said like, yeah, I'm sure at some point, maybe like, you know, if you try for 20 years, it's probably bound to happen, you know, but I would have expected this to be when I'm like 35 or something. So the fact that I got to go to the college tournament and just witness that was definitely a surprise. And that was actually, that's actually one of like my most like formative favorite memories from this school year. Um, and it's been a crazy school year. So I don't say that lightly, just, yeah, just, just meeting everyone and coming friends with you guys. And, uh, having that weekend was just um really special and like i think that's what surprised me is just like just how how cool everyone was and just how enjoyable the whole thing was um especially as someone you know without any pressure on him because i was the alternate but yeah no that was i think the most surprising thing is just like how enjoyable it all was and like how i just didn't really feel stressed out like even even before my first game like i was a little stressed but i was like you know i'm here like that's that's all you need to do is just get here Mm -hmm. you know uh, a lot of people talk about how like su- how surprised they are by like how small the actual set is. Mm. It didn't really feel small to me. It felt big enough like for how it looks on TV. I like, guess how cold it was it was a little surprising. Mm. How good I think how like you know solid the the like craft services lunch and stuff was because mm. like the food was pretty solid. I thought it was just gonna be kind of like garbage like cafeteria food, but the lunch was enjoyable. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, if you ask me, um, I also didn't think the Jeopardy set was like, that small. I think it looked pretty yeah. much the same size as it did on tv if anything i thought the jeopardy or not jeopardy the wheel of fortune stage was bigger than i imagined oh yeah the wheel the wheel stage is huge yeah. um yeah that was surprising actually that was one of the big surprises was getting to see the wheel stage and getting to see the wheel and everything i did oh and i actually uh no I, I just remembered this i don't know how i could forget but on i think it was my first game i think it was the one with joel and katie vanna white showed up what uh no yeah, way. Vanna White showed up, That's and she just like she just came by and said like, "Hey, like, good luck, guys." Like, so it wasn't uh, just her and the cardboard cutout in like the the foyer or anything. It was like the real no, yeah, yeah it wasn't what? just that. No, yeah, it was actually Vanna. Um, and like she said hi to us and stuff. And that was I remember just being behind the podium when that happened. But yeah, that was crazy. I was not expecting that. She must have just been into you know do contract stuff or rehearsal or something because um if the listeners don't know, they uh, wheel a Jeopardy's share a cruise. They tape on different days. 
and they use each other's because the guy I know who's on wheel, he was saying that they use the Jeopardy stage as their kind of staging grounds for wheel. Like they do their hair and makeup there, which mm. is funny because we use wheel for that on Jeopardy. But yeah, so that was that was the biggest surprise was actually getting to meet Vanna. <laughs> that was that was that was a very pleasant, very fun surprise because I, I watch wheel too at home. Mm. I love wheel. I'm I'm less good at like word stuff than with trivia, so I, I've always liked Jeopardy slightly more. But but wheel's wonderful. Um, so it was real cool to meet Vanna. I guess I'll skip down to another question that I was going to ask you later, but do you have any other fun behind the scenes stories just like that one that maybe our listeners didn't get to see when the cameras weren't rolling? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember if it was actually the syndicated program or JNCC, but I do remember for one thing, there was like a rumor uh, that Jim Carrey was around. What? Um, I didn't hear doing some. I, th- I think that was that was probably the syndicated program then because it was college we all would have been talking about. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. the syndicated program. One of my tape days... Jim Carrey was around again, just doing contract stuff or maybe doing some like Sonic voice work or something. <laughs> so is that a Sony picture? I, can't I have remember. no idea, um, but I do the mo- know the movies out. So could have been. Yeah. Movie. So, uh, so yeah. So Jim Carrey was around for something, uh, apparently just walking around uh, the lot. I did not see him. I don't think any of my fellow contestants saw him. Maybe he's a producer that saw him and just told us. But uh, so that was kind of fun. But yeah, I don't know. I think Vanna was probably the coolest thing that happened. Also, just the crazy uh, coincidence with Kira. And then I don't know. I mean, everything was just uh, was pretty smooth and routine as far as I guess taping a game show goes. <laughs> I believe I've asked this question for everyone who's guested on this podcast that was also in the JNCC, as well as Kira when I interviewed her and Kristen. This is probably the last time I'll throw it to someone because they've all pretty much shared the same answer. Mm-hmm. Despite the results you achieved on the syndicated show, would you have preferred to have been on the JNCC? Do you think you could have done as well, if not better? Because if you ask me, Finn, I, I think you could have been a serious contender, especially with that buzz percentage I mentioned earlier. I mean, 64%. well, I, I really, yeah, I really appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> but personally, I don't think so. I, I'm glad that it happened the way it happened. Because like I said earlier, you get the Jeopardy experience twice. That's crazy. You know, that really only happens to like TFC people and stuff. And I, no, I, yeah, I just, I'm glad that I wasn't on JNCC. I'm glad I was there for it, but I'm glad I wasn't on it. Cause at the end of the day, I would have run into like a just Karin or a Raymond who just would have just destroyed me. Like, yeah, if I, if I got Raymond as my, as my, <laughs> you know, initial quarterfinal game, it would have been over. I would have been toast. Cause I remember I actually, like you're talking about how like you were kind of scared of Raymond. I can't remember if you were there for this or not. Cause not everyone made it to this. I think you probably were. Oh yeah, because you went to sushi, didn't you, that first night? Uh, no, I did not. And that's oh, you one didn't. Of my, yeah, oh, that yeah. was one of my regrets. Um, yeah, being yeah. So, so before and staying yeah, in my room. Yeah, before sushi that first night, we all kind of met up in the lobby and watched that night's episode because someone was able to stream it. And Raymond was just like killing it. He was just getting like every clue before anyone else. And that was the moment where I was like, okay, I'm glad I'm an alternate. Like this guy, <laughs> like I like 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 I'm just I'm glad I'm glad that I'm not playing against people like this guy because Raymond is such a beast. And I mean like, and obviously Jess Carr and um and just yeah people like Liz and like yeah like there's just like I mean everyone was so good. Everyone was so good. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad it worked out the way it did. I have no regrets. Have you read any messages or reactions from randoms on social media? Has anyone from your distant past suddenly reached out to congratulate you? I know that happened to me. And if so, do you mind sharing some of the more memorable interactions with us? I remember one of the really funny things was I had some like random like people from all over the country just like in my DMs and like like asking me out. And I was like, like my DMs are kind of a dry place. So uh, that was... That was really funny and novel. Uh, obviously, nothing came of that because, like, how do you go on a date with someone who lives in New Jersey? <laughs> and, like, also, a little a little kind of weird, definitely kind of strange, just having people see you on TV and then being like, let me take you out. And it's like, well, one, we don't live in the same place. Two, like, you could have at least, like, you know, introduced yourself first. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm a little old school with that. But, like, uh, it was it was just kind of weird. Um, but funny it definitely it wasn't like uncomfortable it was just kind of weird and funny so that was kind of the the funny thing about that uh it was um it was fun to like hear from like former teachers and stuff definitely definitely a lot of really nice messages from like friends and family the media coverage a little less kind but but still funny uh but yeah there wasn't like any crazy like reconnection per se or like i met the love of my life because of Jeffrey or anything <laughs> like that you know like not, nothing 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 like that but yeah no like crazy stories or anything like that yeah i remember right after my episode aired i got so many dms from friends family strangers past teachers on facebook all of a sudden and it took me about 48 hours total from when my episode finished airing to get back to everyone because i really wanted to get back to everyone I, I mean this is a big deal for me i'm glad people are reaching out and remember me so 
it's just great getting to hear from everybody even if it's been like years or perhaps even decades you know yeah no definitely that was really nice and it was just yeah it was sweet everyone was just so kind and supportive definitely like a very like healthy good like ego boost you know it was just it was just nice to feel appreciated and mm -hmm. celebrated you know forty thousand dollars plus is a lot of money for a college student so as we begin to wrap up this episode my final question for you finn is how do you plan on allocating your winnings? Are you going to put some towards your undergrad, maybe start an investment account, save some for a vacation? Uh, I haven't really thought through the like kind of more nitty gritty financial stuff per se, because I haven't gotten the check yet. And I do have to you know, figure out taxes because that's going to be a whole thing, um, especially since it's next year. I'll just give you the fun answer. When I'm going to Europe this summer for my Paris study abroad, I'll be sticking around for a while. I'm going to meet up with a friend and we're going to go to like the netherlands and germany for a week <laughs> and then um and then after that i'm kind of cut loose so i'm just gonna solo travel a bit i haven't decided i have a lot of places i want to go so you know some candidates are like i'd love to see scandinavia I'm heavily considering some parts of eastern europe because i have a friend who's a uh, first generation romanian so if hmm. she's going back out i might meet up with her in romania north africa's calling my name pretty hard right now so i might i might hit like egypt morocco tunisia algeria if i get the chance I don't know. I think that realistically what's going to happen is I'm probably just going to go to Germany for that week. And then I think I might just go to, cause like uh, my roommate um, is going to be studying in London. So I might just go to London and then I might just hang out in Scotland for like two weeks after that. So I'll, yeah, the, the short, the short answer is travel. <laughs> Travel's like the fun answer. There's a couple, like I haven't made any big purchases. Well, cause one, I don't have the money yet. And two, I don't want to encourage myself to do that. I might, so I think if all goes according, according to plan, I'll be living in an off-campus apartment next year. I mm. might get like a nice espresso machine because uh, that's that's a purchase that I've wanted to make for a while. And I'm just a big coffee guy. So uh, I might get an espresso machine. <laughs> but there's, I, I'm not going to like, you know, be buying a car or anything, putting a down payment on a car or anything like that, you know. <laughs> Once you take out taxes and stuff, it's still a substantial amount of money. It's easy to spend down really quickly so i have to be careful i'm definitely gonna be saving and investing a good amount of it you know do the smart thing but we'll see sounds like a lot of fun and sounds like you have a plan so with that that brings us to the end of our interview thank you so much finn for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about your jeopardy journey and experience i know it was a bit tricky trying to find the time of day to do this but i'm so glad we made it work hopefully future contestants or enthusiastic fans were able to learn something new about what it's like to audition prepare for and actually be on the show congratulations once again on your successful run and before we sign off where can people find you online is there anything or anyone you'd like to plug or shout out go right ahead i do have a twitter account on jeopardy twitter that i never use but i might be more active again i think usually it's like fin jeopardy but i'm gonna change that because that's kind of stupid um but i don't know I, I don't really post much on social media so you don't have to go look it for me yeah i don't know i don't really have anything to plug i'm not like an artist or anything like that uh i guess go bruins you know next year will be our year for march madness we'll see i guess i guess that's it thanks so much for having me on um and uh, it was real nice to talk to you again jerry of course and thank you once again and now this is when i close out the show by asking you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to post podium is available on all sorts of listening platforms including amazon music anchor apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, radio public soundcloud spotify and stitcher so make sure to follow and subscribe for the latest episodes I've been your host, Jarek Bruel, and remember, if someone asks what you're listening to, always phrase your response in the form of a question. What is post-podium? See you in the next one. Mm -hmm.